Hello, I'm Hermann Mucke. Uh, I uh, am in charge of work package for uh, repo trial, and uh, this was the work package which, among other things, uh, had uh, patents in its responsibility. So uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, patents, what they are and what you have to look out for if you are dealing with patents. Of course, it will be uh, only the most cursory introduction. Uh, sadly, many life scientists don't uh, have the proper uh, attitude towards patents. Uh, they know, of course, that patents exist. They know that uh, you need patents uh, if you want uh, protection uh, from exploitation uh, by others. Uh, but many misunderstandings are floating around and uh, I want to dispel some of these. So. The first opinion is patents protect my invention against exploitation, which is perfectly true. There is nothing more to say about this. Um, those of you who have uh, already delved into uh, patent documents will uh, have encountered uh, many, which for scientists are, <laughs> well, uh, difficult to understand and to read, uh, very legalistic in its language. So uh, the opinion abounds that the patent is something that uh, a scientist doesn't write, the patent attorney does this, and that's a specialized uh, type of attorney. Well, for the claims section, this is true. Uh, I would never write the claims section myself, only tell my patent attorney what I want to be claimed. But the body text, of course, uh, you are free to write in your own style as long as you stick to certain regulations, which really don't uh, limit you in uh, describing your science here. So uh, if you see patent texts which sound trivial to you, uh, uh, maybe endlessly redundant, uh, then uh, it will be something like, for instance, uh, when you claim a dosage range for a drug, it would say 5 milligrams, 7.5 milligrams, 10 milligram, 12.5 uh, milligram, and so on. That's a patent legalistic language, but it's not always necessary. Any good science, you will think, will be published sooner or later in a peer-reviewed journal in a regular way, so why bother about patents? Well, there are very good reasons to look into the patent space, uh, because uh, the intent uh, that people have in filing a patent application is quite different from the intent uh, they have uh, when they submit a manuscript. Uh, a peer review manuscript is uh, something that should be totally up to date and uh, present something that you really want your scientific colleagues to know as quickly as possible. <laughs> Often, as you certainly know, Review takes a very long time, but nevertheless, it's your intent. But if you file a patent application, that's something different. Then you believe that what you have found and what you are describing there can be commercially exploited within a few years at least. So what you write a patent for and what you publish uh, might be quite different things. It's quite valid to say that uh, patents are the other half of scientific literature. And uh, it's not just scientific literature, it's also universal open access. Because the three major patent offices, which you see here, the European one, the US one, and the so-called international one uh, from the Patent Convention Treaty, they offer you access uh, to millions and millions of patent documents free of charge 
and uh, without uh, any registration, without needing to open any account, nothing. It's totally free. Uh, contrary uh, to what many believe, uh, patents are the freest sort of access to science that you can have. What do you do before you can even think about filing a patent application? And the rule number one is <laughs> shut up. Okay, shut up. Don't say anything about your invention. Uh, most importantly, don't write anything. Uh, and anything that uh, you put out into the open has the potential to damage your priority. And priority in patents is everything. So, typical examples are scientific manuscripts. Of course, reviewers for such manuscripts uh, have signed reviewer confidentiality agreements. But, well, yes, don't rely on it, okay? <laughs> uh, then, of course, there are the posters and the oral presentations you might want to make uh, at scientific meetings. And there are the theses uh, which your students write. And remember, that's key. Uh, don't do any preliminary disclosure because only the priority date, which is the date you file with your patent office, gives you this key date. Uh, the second rule is check your legal situation. If you are working at a university or at another sort of uh, institution, uh, your invention won't belong to you. It will belong to your university or other institution. What belongs to you, of course, is the inventor rights. And these inventor rights uh, will uh, certainly be specified in your employment contract, which I urge you to check for this. Next thing is, uh, you need uh, to determine who the inventor is, because uh, excluding an inventor from a patent uh, might lead even to invalidation. Yeah. Also, uh, putting someone uh, who has not made a significant uh, contribution to the concept of the invention on a patent might also lead to invalidation. So what's conception? Uh, laboratory work by a laboratory technician uh, will not entitle to inventorship. If you have conceived the experiment, of course, if you have conceived the invention as such, and so on, then uh, this person is an inventor. Next important thing, uh, has third party uh, funding been used for the invention in this case? This third party uh, most likely will have rights in the invention. And in some cases, those rights uh, will be waived, such as with uh, many European Union projects. But in uh, other cases, uh, your government, for instance, might have rights. Rule number three is, and this applies only uh, if you are not an employee, because in this case, uh, your institution will determine this. What is your business strategy? How does your patent application fit into this business strategy? This is a universe in its own. Uh, and what's your patenting strategy in the context of other patents that have already been filed? and what uh, might be planned for filing. Next thing, where to file. Uh, if you are at a state-owned university, this will have been decided in advance because you need to do this, in most cases, at your national patent office. But there are other ways too. You can file directly with the European uh, Patent Court you can uh, file directly with the so-called International Biro, which will uh, then go to the PCT, the Patent Convention Treaty. Most important, perhaps, because this is a trap uh, individual inventors frequently uh, fall in, budget your patent costs. It's cheap, really, uh, filing a national patent. You can do this for a few thousand euros in fees, and uh, even the patent attorney might be included in this. 
But then, once you internationalize, uh, meaning you want preliminary protection in all the countries you have identified, then it becomes quite expensive. And uh, as you proceed further, uh, doing the national applications that are really defendable patents when they end up, or regional patents like the EPO, uh, then this becomes very expensive. So you need uh, to act preemptively here. And it's not uncommon to see uh, that individual inventors just drop out of the process because they run out of money or don't want to commit the funds anymore. Also, don't forget, even if you get a patent, uh, it's not over. Yeah. You need to maintain the patents in all legislatures. You might need to defend it too. All this is not free either. So before you actually sit down and write a patent, uh, what else do you need to do? Uh, certainly, you need a complete understanding of the prior art. And that's not only the peer review papers, but also the patents. Your patent attorney will help you in searching these. You can do it yourself. Uh, there are ways to do a freedom to operate analysis by yourself. Uh, but this is another matter again. Uh, as I said, searching patents is a little bit different from searching peer review, uh, which you all know, and uh, requires uh, certain skills that uh, not everybody will have. So in the end, uh, you will have to determine, is it really novel what you have found? And there might be surprises because uh, what you think uh, is novel uh, might not be because uh, your patent attorney, for instance, has found uh, a patent document that has preempted it. On the other hand, he might or she might point out uh, that uh, things that you believe are not novel at all because they are not particularly interesting scientifically are quite uh, patentable uh, under current law. So always remember criteria of novelty and inventiveness are different in patent law. They are not the same that you will apply uh, for academic science. In any patent document that you write, uh, you have uh, to give examples and show some data. Uh, 30 years ago, you can could get a patent out of uh, just the text. These times are over. Uh, you need to present firm data, but and that's a big but. You have to choose them wisely. Uh, disclose only what you have to, uh, not more than you must, uh, because during the examination process, the examiner might uh, come to you and ask you for those data anyway. But you don't need to put them out in the public right now in many cases. So disclose as much as you need to, but as little as possible. When you actually sit down and write it, uh, how is writing uh, a drug repurposing patent application different? Uh, with drug repurposing, by definition, uh, the agent you are repurposing is known. So it's not publish, uh, patentable anymore as such. But the new medical use, of course, that's what you want uh, to patent. Uh, in many cases, you will have to change uh, everything uh, about uh, how you present the API anyway. Uh, because your target population will be different. You might uh, want to choose a new route of administration, a new formulation, new dosage schemes, whatever. And all this might be patentable if you can show that it fits the new target population. Actually, if you came to this uh, video, you are seeing now uh, from the repo trial uh, training site, on this uh, same web page, you can find uh, another video by NLO patent attorneys, which explains in great detail how uh, 
drug repurposing patenting is different. Uh, a single patent might not always be sufficient. Uh, you need an entire patent body. So to conclude the entire thing, uh, this is how uh, a so-called PCT patent disclosure looks like. Uh, often it is mistakenly referred to as a world patent, which it isn't. It's not a patent at all. It gives you some preliminary protection, that's true in the countries that you have named, but it's not a patent yet. Yeah? It's uh, the central document uh, which goes on uh, to the national authorities and uh, gets a preliminary examination, uh, which the national authorities can rely on, but uh, are not mandated to rely on. They can have their own ideas. So that was it for the moment. Thank you for your attention and don't forget, patents are the other half of scientific literature. Thank you. <laughs>